Hey, I'm Pastor Blake Davis, and we want to welcome you to the Firm Foundation Church Podcast. We are so thankful that you've chosen to join us today, and our desire is that you are encouraged and challenged through each and every message that we bring. And so we hope that you enjoy the word today. I'd like to read from Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they weren't able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it's often cast him into fire and water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he'd entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now, this passage tells the story of a desperate dad, a desperate dad who brought his demonized son to Jesus for deliverance. But Jesus wasn't there. He was up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the boys, Peter, James, and John, having an encounter with God. And so failing to find Jesus, the man prevails upon the rest of the disciples to help. And their efforts came to nothing. And as Jesus comes down the mountain, the man meets him with this desperate plea. And the story unfolds. It tells of the encounter of this man and his son with Jesus. Now, Jesus is the healer. The boy is the one eventually healed. But the central character in the story is the father. And the man asks Jesus to help if he could. Imagine asking Jesus to help if he could. Jesus rebukes him, and he says all things are possible. And then the desperate man cries out with what I think is one of the most encouraging verses in the entire Bible. I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus rebukes his spirit, and the boy was set free. So... Is there anybody here that can't identify with this man? I believe. Help my unbelief. Now, there's a part of the body of Christ called the faith movement that's taught us that it's our responsibility to manufacture in our minds complete certainty. If only we can summon up this certainty that we believe that God can do something then God will surely do it. It's all up to me. If I can only believe hard enough, it'll happen. But if I have a single doubt in my mind, that's a negative confession and God won't respond to me. And then my guilty conscience comes along and says, well, God hasn't answered my prayer, so there's something wrong with me. Even to the point where, and it's true, people will say, well, that person has cancer and obviously they don't have enough faith or God will heal them. And this kind of stupidity happens. But the problem is that 
It puts everything on us, not on the shoulders of a sovereign God. Now, if you've ever felt like this man felt that then this story is for you, and I'm going to tell you why there's so much hope in it in a moment. But first of all, I have to clarify one thing. The man's unbelief was not directed toward who Jesus was. It was directed toward what Jesus could do. And there's a difference. Because Hebrews says, Hebrews 11 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. So, the man must have pleased God because Jesus answered his prayer. That's what I'm going to get into in a moment. But that shows me that the father in his desperation, even though he said, I believe, help my unbelief, even though he said, if you can help me, he came to Jesus because somehow in his gut, in his heart, he knew who Jesus was. Even though he wasn't sure what Jesus could do for him. So don't be worried if you have a hole in your faith which says to you, you know, your faith is a bit like Swiss cheese, there's holes in it. I'm just not sure that Jesus can do that. Or that, or that. I do think he can do that, but I'm not sure about that. Don't worry about it. It's up to Jesus, not you. So, here's the great message of this story. In spite of the fact that the man asked Jesus to help his unbelief, I think there were four things in his heart which showed that his faith was genuine. And Mike was sharing about the great message that uh, James Hosettler bought, brought about faith being genuine. There were four things that testified to the fact that this man's faith was genuine in spite of the fact that he had doubts. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes I have doubts. And I need to know that God is bigger than my doubts. I need to know that. And here's the first thing. He came in desperation. See, remember, God answered his prayer in the end. And without faith it's impossible to please God. We know that whatever was going on, God saw the genuineness of this man's faith. Why was it genuine? Number one, because he came in desperation. He was desperate for God. Who knows how long he'd waited for Jesus? The dictionary defines desperate this way, reckless from despair. You reckless. Violent. Lawless. Staking everything on a small chance. He was reckless. There was nobody else could help. There was nothing anybody else could do. He only had Jesus. See, our faith is weak because we're complacent. We're complacent. We're just getting along fine. We put our faith in all sorts of other things than Christ to make us happy. We don't have because we don't ask, the Bible tells us. Because we're not desperate for God. Why is it that we wait till we've tried everything else before we come to Jesus? Well, Jesus measured the strength of this man's faith not by the doubts that he had, which he had, he did have, but Jesus measured his strength and the reality of his faith not by the doubts he still had in his mind, but by his willingness as shown in his actions to stake everything on Christ. He was desperate. The disciples had failed him, but his desperation drove him to Jesus. If... if, if <laughs> desperation, God will meet the desperate man or woman. You may have a lot of other things out of order in your life, but if you're desperate for God, there's a desperation that pushed you to the front after you nearly fell asleep in my preaching. Did, did you notice that? I know, might as well put it out on the table. But something I said at the end of it woke him up about repentance. And God had put that in my heart that I had to emphasize that. And something in Alex's heart pushed him to the front. 
and discern, his discerning pastor put the question. There's a desperation because other stuff doesn't cut it, does it? It's Jesus that we need. So this guy was desperate. So if you're desperate, you're qualified. <laughs> That's good news, isn't it? Okay, second thing, then. second thing is this, he came in worship. Why do I know that? Because there's a parallel account in Matthew's gospel of the same story. And it adds a detail that the very first thing the man did when Jesus appeared was he knelt before him. Now, in the middle of Jesus' ministry there, whether this man fully understood exactly everything of who Jesus was and all the theology of that, maybe he didn't, but he knew enough to worship him. He knew enough to come and kneel before him. He recognized God had given Jesus a place of authority and he had to bow before him. And in Matthew's gospel, it says he calls him Lord. Lord. In spite of his desperate situation, he could have been so angry at God, so bitter at God for all the history of what he'd been through with his son. But he comes not in anger and not in bitterness, he comes in worship. He, 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 he's, he's desperate. And he comes in worship. Now, let me say something about worship. Worship isn't just singing songs. Worship is defined in the Bible as the laying down of your life before God. Paul says, present yourselves as a sacrifice, living, holy, and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. But that word reasonable worship means this is worship properly understood. Romans 12 verse 1. So to present yourself, your whole self as a sacrifice to God is the real meaning of worship. So if you do that Monday to Saturday, when you come together in the gathering Sunday morning, the power of God's going to fall. The worship isn't just coming and singing songs. Worship is laying down your life before God. And that's how the guy came. He came and fell at Jesus' feet. Lord! So, number one, he was desperate. Number two, he came in worship. These are things that proved that his faith was real in spite of the fact he's saying, I believe, help my unbelief, right? He came in desperation, number one. He came in worship, number two. Third, he came in honesty. Before Jesus and everybody else, he admitted his doubts and fears. Everybody else was there. They could hear what he was saying. But his desperation included honesty. You know what? Honesty is a sign of real relationship. If you can be honest with your spouse, unfortunately my wife is frequently honest with me. I went to, uh, apparently we had said to another pastor's wife a few weeks ago, uh, you have a, an anointing of honesty. And uh, I was Pastor Toby down in Indiana. And his wife has been decking him ever since. He's a very sweet lady. And every time she delivers truth to her husband the last several weeks, she'd just say, well, it's the anointing of honesty. <laughs> I've suffered from that. <laughs> but it's done me good. <laughs> um, but he was honest. So honesty is a sign of real relationship. Denial is a lack of relationship. If you pussyfoot around things and aren't honest, there's no relationship there. Now, wh why was he honest with Jesus? He was honest with Jesus because he trusted Jesus. This is how I read the story. You know, if I came up to, to Blake and said, Blake, you know, uh, can you pray for me? But actually, I don't know whether you can help me or not. Uh, but I'm here, I'm desperate, right? Um, then uh, that's honesty. But if in my mind, I'm dancing around the whole thing, and I never admit to Blake that I actually don't think he can do or help me very much, but we have a kind of an, a superficial relationship and it, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I mean, obviously, if I tell him you're a jerk, <laughs> he's probably going to punch me. You know, that might be honesty too. But 
uh, honesty is, you know, Blake, I, I respect you. I just don't know whether you can help me or not, but, you know, we're friends. And that's enough for God to work with, isn't it? Uh, it was enough for Jesus to work with. And, I, and, and, and in it, something in the relationship or friendship that Blake and I have, I know that even though I say that to him, he's not going to reject me. He's going to say, yeah, Dave, I'll help you. You know, he might be slightly ticked off that, that I don't think he's all that in a bucket of chicken. Uh, but I'm still coming for help. And if the grace of God is on him. He's going to accept me anyway. See, and that's Jesus. That's how Jesus is, is so amazing with us. I think this guy had hung around Jesus for a while. Maybe he'd seen that prostitute coming. And she poured the oil on Jesus' feet. And Jesus, Jesus didn't say, oh, go away. I don't want to have anything to do with you. He welcomed her. It was scandalous. Maybe, maybe he'd seen the day that Je Jesus had called Zacchaeus out of the tree and then gone to lunch with all the tax collectors and sinners. Maybe he'd seen that. Maybe he'd seen that unclean woman with the issue of blood. She was ritually unclean under Jewish law. She should not have been out of the house. Here she was in the middle of the crowd. Every single person she was touching, she was making unclean. And the worst of all, the greatest rabbi of the day, she came up. And she was grabbing that if she could only touch the hem of his garment. It was total violation of the Jewish law. But the amazing thing was that instead of her making Jesus unclean, he made her clean. And maybe he'd watched these things and somehow in his heart he knew he could come in honesty. Even say to the Son of God, I don't know if you can do it, but I am desperate. I believe, help my unbelief. Because somehow in his heart he knew Jesus would not reject him. And so, uh, Jesus embraces the man in his honesty and in his confession of weakness. Jesus told us we only need a kernel of faith to do great things. And right here, Jesus looks to bless his kernel of faith rather than judging his mountain of unbelief. That's good news. He'll bless your kernel of faith rather than judging your mountain of unbelief. So he came in desperation. He came in worship. He came in honesty. I think all of us can do that this morning. Somebody can say amen. <laughs> and finally... He came in trust. His trust in Jesus had overcome his disappointment with people. See, the disciples had failed him. How many people walk away from the Lord because they've had a bad experience in church or with other Christians? It's depressing when you hear people talk about that. A Christian has apparently failed them. A church has apparently failed them. Well, if you are find the perfect church, let me give you the bad news, you'll wreck it the minute you walk in the door. <laughs> so, let's just settle it uh, that we're all imperfect. When we had new people come to our church, I know what you do, Blake, but I, one of the first things, we had so many people on the revolving door um, that I used to say to people, well, the first thing I'm telling you is that I'll fail you and you'll be disappointed in me at some point. And, and that's just reality. So that doesn't mean that we won't try to live to the highest possible standards and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're looking for perfection, you won't find it here. But this guy here, the disciples had failed him. He, he brought his son to them. They'd done whatever they'd done and nothing had happened. He might have walked away, but he didn't. His faith was strong enough to keep his eyes on Jesus, not Jesus' representatives. And you're putting elders in. The elders will fail you. This may be a revelation, but Mike Berger is not perfect. Well, I know. If Sharon was here, 
but she would be the first one to verify that. (laughs) So don't expect that. Don't walk away from Jesus because you don't like the clone that Blake is wearing. He walked past me on Sunday morning. pastor never even said hello. Well, who knows what else was on his mind? What's wrong with you? You know? Gee. <laughs> We're not seeker sensitive. <laughs> you can love people without pandering to them. It's like, grow up. <laughs> so, people are happy to overlook their own imperfections, but they put somebody else's under a magnifying glass, and then it's just an excuse to walk away from the Lord. I, I find, it, find it interesting in this story that even though the disciples had failed, Jesus doesn't unload on them. Nowhere does it say, nowhere does it say Jesus went to them and said, you know, you guys are damaging my ministry reputation here by not performing. You're failures. You're fired. He didn't. Anyway, this man stayed in church because he'd come to church for the right reason, which was to meet Jesus. If you're here to meet Jesus, you won't be disappointed, ever. So, four things. He came in desperation. He came in worship. He came in honesty. And he came in trust in Jesus. Can I suggest to you that what this man had in his approach to Jesus, desperation, worship, honesty, trust, these are actually the hallmarks of genuine biblical faith. Biblical faith, properly understood, is not a quantity or certainty of mental belief. It's not. Biblical faith is the strength of our personal relationship and trust in Jesus. Biblical faith is the willingness to build my life on that relationship in spite of any doubts I may have in my mind, in spite of where my emotions are going on the roller coaster on any given day. True faith shows itself in the way that we live. The father did have a real amount of belief in his mind, otherwise he wouldn't have gone to Jesus at all. But the belief in his mind was just a product of a trust in his heart. And what was in his heart was enough to drive him to Jesus in spite of the doubts that he had. And that should be an encouragement to us today. The end of the story provides us with one more vital detail. When the disciples came to Jesus asking why they couldn't cast the the demon out, Jesus said, this kind comes out only by prayer. And so, Jesus had gone away. He'd left them for a while. And maybe they'd forgotten that communion with Him was, is the key to getting anything done in the kingdom of God. How many times did Jesus stop preaching and talking to people and healing the sick to just go away and spend time with God. That was the secret that he had. So true faith doesn't come out of positive thinking, out of what I think I can do, or how much I'm believing or declaring or decreeing or confessing or anything like that. True faith comes out of the place of my relationship with Jesus Christ. My communion with Jesus This kind comes out only by prayer. In other words, if you want to do something for God, spend time with God. And He'll send you out. And you may go in fear and trembling. You may go not knowing what's going to happen. The first time I ever preached, my pastor put me up in an open air service. I was about 19 years old or something. It was about 10 years ago. And... (laughs) And... uh, he said, well, you're preaching. And, and then he wasn't there. He, was, he had another engagement. He couldn't, and there was hundreds of people there in this open air thing. And we had had 
in our church, our pastor had a very powerful ministry in deliverance, and he had completely destroyed the local witches' coven. Half of them had got saved. Uh, the other half were dead. And uh, I knew that because uh, one of the girls that I knew quite well in the church had been a witch, and she told me. And as I was about to get up on this bandstand and preach to these, all these people, and I never preached before in my life, I was, my knees were shaking, I was nervous as all get out. She comes up to me, and, and she's just white in the face, ashen white. And she said, oh, she said, the head warlock over this entire area is so angry at what the pastor has done with destroying the coven that he's coming here to this meeting tonight and he is going to curse whoever is preaching. <laughs> well, what do you do? My pastor had asked me to preach. I was already scared stiff. So I just went up and preached and did my best. Probably thought I'd, I, you know, it had been a complete failure, whatever. Um, and in the end, by the grace of God, the warlock never came. God detained him somewhere else, which shows that spiritual warfare and this kind of thing is very, very real. But God often calls us to do things when you don't feel like doing them, when you feel totally inadequate. God can do a lot with a little, but he can do everything with nothing. And if you know you're nothing, you're a great candidate to be used by God. And that was me that night, that's for sure. Whether my preaching has gone uphill or downhill, since then you'll have to judge. Nobody, nobody's fallen asleep this morning anyway, huh? so things are looking kind of good. Okay. Now, there's one more thing here before I finish. In that other account in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew adds another detail. He says to the disciples that their failure to cast the Spirit out was because of their little faith. But then he says, if you have faith, because they came and asked him, what is it? Why, why couldn't we succeed? And I said, he didn't, he didn't go and say, you bunch of bozos. But they came and said, well, Lord, why is it that we, we couldn't do it? And he said, well, you had little faith. And then he says, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. Well, wait a minute. That's a problem. The mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. So Jesus says, first of all, their problem was their little faith, small faith. Then he says, you only need small faith to do the impossible. Well, the answer is that this first word, small faith, it doesn't actually mean small faith. It means weak faith. It means a poor quality of faith. So what Jesus is saying here, he's not criticizing their small quantity of faith. He's criticizing their poor quality of faith. If you come to Jesus with desperation, honesty, worship, and trust, those four things, Jesus is saying, you can do anything, even with the tiniest quantity of faith, but you can't do much with a poor quality of faith. Now, a poor quality of faith is not a faith without doubt. It's a faith without trust. I will always have doubts in my faith, no matter what I do. But do I have trust in Jesus? And your trust in Jesus is shown by what you do. That night, all those years ago, on that bandstand, I got up. In other words, I obeyed. Even though I was scared stiff, even though I thought it was a hopeless situation and whatever I say would come to nothing, and I wanted to run, I didn't. God doesn't judge you for all your ups and downs and your emotions and your mind and all the rest of it. He judges you. Did you actually do it or not? What you do when your friends call you to go out? You say, no, I'm not going out. Maybe you still want to go out a little bit. <laughs> but you say, no, I'm not. That's obedience. Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 16 talks about the obedience of faith. It means faith is obedience and obedience is faith. And in between in the book of Romans is the whole gospel. The beginning and the end of it is just obeying God. You can obey God 
even if you have all this stuff going on in your mind. If you wait until you have it all figured out, you'll never obey God or do anything for God. I'm trying to encourage you this morning. The desperate father had a small quantity of faith. Help my unbelief. But he had a good quality of faith, I believe. So, real faith draws us back to our relationship with the Lord. As you cast yourself upon God in trust, as you seek to maintain a real depth of relationship with Him, you can be like Peter. And you know, Pete, he uh, only ever seemed to open his mouth to change feet. So that's an encouragement to me too. And, but he, he was in for it. He was, he was up for it. And Jesus comes along walking on the water. And Peter was the only guy that got out of the boat. At least he got out of the boat. That was him. And then, of course, he took his eyes off Jesus. And he began to look at the waves. But Jesus reached out and grabbed him. Why? I believe, help my unbelief. He had doubts, but he was obedient. That's an important story because the book of Revelation tells us that in the presence of God in the eternal kingdom, the sea will become as crystal. See, in the Bible, the sea is pictured as the dwelling place of evil, starting with the Red Sea and the beast that comes out of the sea in the book of Revelation and all the rest of it. And the Bible tells us that the sea will be calmed so that you can walk on it in the presence of God. And that's what Jesus, that's why Jesus walked on the water. It wasn't just because it was the quickest way to get from, you know, three rivers to Paul Paul. It was walking across a lake in between. It was because he was prophetically announcing that he was going to destroy the powers of hell so that you could walk in the water. And when he invited Pete out of the boat, He was saying, Pete, you can come walk with me. That's you. That's you, Alex. You can come walk with Jesus in this adventure of faith. You know, come on. Get out of the boat and walk with me a bit. It's it's an amazing thing. I always like to do it with younger guys. There was a young guy that came over from England years ago, and we were at Centerville. And I said to Don, uh, I, I believe this guy has a prophetic call in his life, and I like to push him out of the boat a little bit. And it, would that be okay with you? Because you always have to get the pastor's permission, right? And uh, Don said, fine. And so I announced at the end of the service that I'd be available to pray for people. Um, Elaine wasn't with me at the time, it was just me. So I'll pray for people over here. And I said, Duncan, that was his name. I said, I'd like all the men under 30 in the church to go over there and Duncan will pray and prophesy over you. Poor Duncan. He turned white as a sheet. Or he was going to die. <laughs> But I knew God had told me to push him out of the boat. And for two and a half hours, he prayed and prophesied accurately. I know that because one or two of the elders stood with him over every one of those men that came forward. And it changed his life. Duncan went to Africa. He ran a ministry school run by a couple called Roland Heidi Baker, who planted 13,000 churches or something. He saw the dead raised to life. Biblical miracles. It was absolutely extraordinary. God... Did he feel inadequate? Yes. Did he do what he was? Did he step out of the boat? Yes. I, I, you know, you translate that into whatever challenge you're facing in life. But I want to give you some encouragement this morning. I believe, help my unbelief. If, 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 if that's where you're at, then join the club. Because that's me too. Every day, it's I believe, help my unbelief. And, but Lord, I'm trusting you that I've got something in my relationship with you that if I just obey, even though I, I don't know what's going to happen, that you'll honor my faith because I'm desperate, because I'm coming in desperation, I'm coming in worship, I'm being honest, and I'm trusting you. That's so encouraging. As long we, we, All we need is a very small amount of faith, but as long as our faith is rooted in our relationship with Jesus, any of us can do the impossible. What is the impossible? It could be a miracle. We pray for some people in the last couple of days, and God to, for God to do a miracle. 
That may be the impossible. Maybe the impossible is just to persevere in an incredibly difficult situation of grief or loss or family breakdown or financial disaster, but you're just not walking away from Jesus in the midst of it. You guys know what that's like. You're still here. You walk through it. You know, ask them for their story. But you see, we just don't walk away. We may feel like it, but we don't. We're still here because we have our eyes on eternity. That's the impossible. You can trust. It's, it's, let me put it this way. We were going through a difficult situation. We, we've had several things go on. One of our uh, daughters got cancer and th- th- this and this went on and some real challenges over the last few years with our family. And uh, I mean, we've also seen God do amazing things. But we had a friend in England that sent my wife a video and she said, just watch this. You know, the video was uh, the longest train tunnel in the Alps. And I don't know how long it went on for, 10 minutes or something, a few minutes. You know, there's nothing to it because it's just dark. It's on the front of the train going through this tunnel. And after about eight or 10 minutes, there's a speck of light. And Elaine just started to weep. You know, there's light at the end of your tunnel. If you're just faithful, like this man was, you can see the impossible happen. He should be an encouragement, this desperate dad, to all of us. You don't have to be a superhero of faith for God to meet you. You just have to be faithful. That's all. And that is possible for all of us this morning. Let's stand together. Now just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you for a moment. Digest the stuff that I've said. Maybe there's some part of it that has really hit home. Uh, In a moment, I'm going to give the service back over to Pastor Blake. But I want to invite you to respond to the Lord. However you want to do that. Just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning. And every one of them is in a different life situation facing their own challenges and circumstances. And Lord, I don't have an answer for anybody, but I know that you do. And I thank you, Lord, for every time I've been desperate and you've met me in my life and just kept me. And Father, I know that you're the same God with the same love for every person here that you have for me. And in your mysterious ways, Lord, you don't just keep us from anything bad happening to us. You allow us to walk through that tunnel until eventually the light dawns. And in the perspective of eternity, when we meet you face to face, it will all come right. Everything that was wrong will come right. Even the things we can't see now. But now, Lord, is the moment in which we need your help. And I reach out to you this morning for those that need help that are listening to me speaking, even those that might be listening online or listening late at some later date. Thank you, Father, for reaching out to each one of them by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would show your faithfulness. Surely you will show your faithfulness because that's who you are. But I pray, Lord, you'd find faithfulness in us as we respond so that we can see you do the great things that you love to do. In Jesus' name and to his glory. Amen.
Thanks for tuning in to the Firm Foundation Church Podcast. If what you heard today was inspirational or transformative, tell us about it. We love your feedback. Join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We are located at 61070 M40 in Pawpaw, Michigan. For more information on how you can get connected, check us out at firmfoundation.church. Thanks.